Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Sean from All Things EV and back with another video. This time I've got my buddy Rob from Tesla Daily Podcast on to talk about Tesla's Q1 numbers and what Q2 might look like for the company. Rob, super glad to have you on again. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Always happy to be here. Yes, absolutely. So um, you were um, uh, un un uncharacteristically accurate with your prediction for deliveries for Q1 of 2020. Um, did that surprise you when you heard Tesla's numbers when they published them? It did surprise me. It did. As much as I would love to take credit and say, you know, that's what I expected. It, it is what I forecast. Um, so I had production at 101,000, deliveries at 88,000. Production came in at like 102.7 and deliveries at 88.4. So pretty close. Um, but as I talked about with Galley sort of the day before that, we did sort of a similar thing to what we're doing today. And, um, you know, the point that I made there is while these numbers are, are my forecast, there's so much unknown with this quarter that I wouldn't be surprised to be significantly off. So, yeah, I'm happy it came in with what I forecast, but I was also surprised um, just because there were so many unknowns this quarter specifically with just how much Tesla is going to be able to deliver in the macro environment um, going on, you know, how much that would affect their actual ability to deliver cars and then how much that would affect actual customers ability to take delivery. So um, I think all things considered, definitely a really strong quarter for Tesla. And I think obviously the market reaction has shown that it was ahead of expectations. Um, but yeah, there was certainly a lot of uncertainty heading into it. Yeah, it was a big variable. I mean, you not only had uh, coronavirus in China impact the first part of the quarter, but then then it sort of managed to 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 scale and grow globally, and eventually impacted uh, Fremont manufacturing uh, in in the U.S. So um, certainly a very unique unique impact, global impact to manufacturing for Tesla. Um, what, where do you see Tesla going and adjusting now? It looks like China is is sort of back up and running again, where at the moment, as we're recording this video, Fremont is still shut down. So how does Tesla pivot uh, and, and continue to strive to meet the uh, annual production number, manufacturing or delivery numbers of half a million vehicles in 2020? Yeah, for sure. And I think that was one of the interesting things about the Q1 production and delivery report. I think a lot of people were looking for an update there on guidance, whether that update be, you know, lowering guidance or sort of just refusing to give guidance or whether that would be reaffirming their 500,000 delivery target. And we didn't see either. So it's sort of, I don't know, you could see it as a neutral or maybe even a positive that they didn't actually lower guidance. So we'll definitely have to see um, on the Q1 earnings call just sort of what Tesla's thoughts are around that if they if they do update. Um, I've done a couple of videos just sort of outlining a path. I think if Tesla does restart production around May 4th and they can kind of get that up and running within a couple of weeks after that to sort of the speed that they were at before, there's still a really clear path to 500,000 deliveries this year based on what's happening with Gigafactory Shanghai in China. So um, that's, I think, one of the reasons that the stock has also been performing strong is the delivery and production report was good, but since then we've had really good news on production from China. Um, the reports are that they produced about 10,000 vehicles in March. So over, you know, four and a half weeks, that's about 2,300 per week, which means that, you know, the peak rate for Tesla in any one week in March was probably actually a little bit higher than that, maybe up to 3,000 per week. So we can kind of project that forward going through Q2. And then um, Tesla's basically gone from zero to, you know, 3,000 a week within four months there from when they first started production at Shanghai. So that's incredible progress. And I think what investors are looking at is saying, okay, if Tesla can do that in four months, what can they do in the next four months? And that's really offsetting the risk that we're seeing um, from Fremont being shut down. Does Tesla accelerate their plans to manufacture Model Y in China, in your opinion? Is that something that is, as they're looking at shifting where they're producing and, and delivering cars in a coronavirus environment, is that, is that a higher probability in your opinion? I think theoretically it does make sense. The question I would have is, can they really accelerate it any more than what they already have? Um, I think the the expansion plans at Shanghai are already really aggressive. So yeah, my biggest question on that would be, you know, if they can do it and if that would detract from ramping up the Model 3 from Shanghai, because obviously that's the path they've headed down here first. So I'm sure, you know, the demand is, would obviously be there, no question, if they were to do something like that. I think it's just a matter of priorities and what Tesla can actually accomplish in that span of time. Are there other lines of business for Tesla that they could potentially leverage uh, if if 
manufacturing of vehicles is, is slow or depressed just globally in general. Are there some other lines of business that you think that they could spool up as well to help compensate for the lack of, of automobile sales? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, obviously, they're still going to have lease revenue coming in. That's still a pretty small percentage of Tesla sales, though, so that's not going to do a whole lot, though it would be pretty good margin revenue. Um, I think solar sort of solar and energy sort of face similar constraints to the vehicle business in terms of Tesla actually being able to produce. Um, so, you know, maybe if they were able to, for some reason, get Gigafactory Nevada up and running uh, more quickly and Gigafactory New York up and running more quickly than Fremont, for example, just based on, you know, Tesla's allowed to operate, but who knows sort of how they play that with the county and things like that. Um, if they were to, you know, get those up and running quicker, then maybe they could generate some revenue off of energy and solar. Um, but I think they're kind of in the same constraint situation right now. The only other one that, you know, immediately comes to mind would be the ventilator situation, but it sounds like Tesla's going to pretty much donate those, um, which is, you know, it's obviously a really nice thing for them to do, um, both working on it and then providing them at either at cost or free, whatever their, their plan is there. Um, so that's probably not going to be anything significant from a revenue perspective. So I think we're kind of just waiting there. And then, you know, maybe if there's anything with software, like if um, we're supposed to see some new full self-driving features come out here pretty shortly, we've obviously seen in early access the stoplight and stop sign um, functionality. When Tesla does end up delivering that to a broad set of users, they can start to recognize some revenue from deferred revenue over time from those features that have been missing. Um, so that'll be a revenue boost. And again, that's high margin. Uh, it's not going to cover the loss of vehicle sales, but it is, you know, it might position the financials a little bit, a little bit better. That's not going to affect the cash flow because they've already got the cash, but uh, from a profitability perspective, that would show up. I've kind of kicked around the idea of, of energy storage. You, you, you've got governments and hospitals that are continuing to operate in, in, in need uh, sustainable, sustainable power and, and energy. Part of me wonders if, if they can start to transition and, and, and be able to have an exemption for manufacturing battery cells for, for governments, uh, for governments and, and, and hospitals and, and the like during this coronavirus. Will, will this thing last long enough? Will the issues last long enough globally for that to, to, to make business sense in your opinion? Um, I think it's sort of a two prong question. Like the, the first piece of it, I would agree. I think the situation that we're in right now probably heightens awareness and heightens demand for, um, you know, having your own sources of energy, not necessarily relying on a third party. Um, so I think from a residential perspective and certainly from a commercial perspective, situations like this just make people think about those risks a little bit more and trying to offset them. And Tesla Energy is a great way to do that um, with more energy independence. Even from a national level, I think that's something to consider. So you have residential, commercial, and the national. Um, so I think there's a lot of macroeconomic forces that sort of benefit Tesla in, in those regards. And then in terms of like how the shutdown might, um, you know, how long it lasts and how the impact from that is, I think it's a great point that there would probably be an exemption for projects like that. But Tesla as an automotive, um, you know, player, they already can technically manufacture. It's more just a, an issue of, okay, doing what's best for the employees. You know, you have supply chain issues because every supplier is sort of managing this thing a little bit differently. So, you know, if you have one missing part, you can't really ship your vehicle. So maybe with fewer parts and things like that, energy is able to get, you know, back up to speed a little bit more quickly, but I don't think that would happen from like a regulatory perspective necessarily. I noticed that with the Q1 numbers, we saw um, quite a big difference between production and delivery. Um, I don't follow it as closely as, as you do. So is that is that typical of, of each quarter? Because I seem to recall that there's usually a little bit more parity with the two. So what do you make of that? Is that because they, they, they started producing and then coronavirus disrupted the ability for Tesla to deliver those vehicles that they produce in the quarter? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's something that's pretty often misunderstood because as you say, a lot of, a lot of the time Tesla is either at parity or they're actually delivering more vehicles than what they produce. So if we go back to 2019, Q2 2019, Q3 2019, Q4 2019, all of those quarters, deliveries outpaced production. Obviously you can't do that forever because you're gonna run out of vehicles. Uh, so what you see then is you'll have a quarter where production outpaces deliveries and then the following quarters, you kind of go back to that 
path. So over time, it obviously evens out. It's just a little bit seasonal in nature about when those, um, when you're drawing down from inventory or when you're building it back up. And Q1 was very predictably a build back up quarter, even before all the coronavirus situation um, started to impact things. So my estimate for the spread between production and deliveries was always pretty significant thousands of vehicles just because Tesla had shipped, you know, 10,000 more vehicles than they had delivered or than they had produced um, over the last three quarters. So you need to make that up at some point. And the inventory at the end of Q4 was the lowest it's been in four years. They only had 11 days of inventory. That's basically, you know, what's on the ships and not really a, a lot else. So Tesla needs to have it in stores. Um, they like to carry inventory now with the Model 3 being such a high volume product that people can just come in and walk away with a vehicle. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty expected that that would happen. The variability that I talked about was really just like how much inventory would would be remaining. And I think with the deliveries coming in at 88,000, it shows that there was still really strong demand because that sort of a spread between production and deliveries was pretty close to what I had expected prior to all this happening. So I think they pretty much sold what was available and sort of what they intended to in Q1. I think the really interesting question though is like going forward into Q2, how does this impact things? Because I think a lot of the coronavirus stuff, especially in the United States, was happening late in Q1 where a lot of buyers probably had already, you know, made the decision, lined up the financing, everything like that, where you just really have to take delivery of the vehicle versus Q2, I think we're going to see more of the economic fallout. And that's, I think, a lot of uncertainty around that right now. What did you, what did you make of, this is the first time that, that Tesla combined Model 3 and Model Y because this is the first quarter that they they started delivering them. Were you surprised that they're combining the, the the two? It makes it a little bit more difficult to determine how many Model Ys they actually delivered in Q1. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was a little bit surprised. I expected them to give an update on Model Y, and I also expected them to give an update on Gigafactory Shanghai production rate, especially now knowing that it was a pretty strong production month in March from Gigafactory Shanghai, but they failed to mention the specifics on either of those. I think in general, Tesla is trying to get to a place where they're giving less information and a little bit less guidance because they don't necessarily need to. And when they do start to give more information, you know, the Tesla community is is pretty rabid about taking that information and run, running with it, um, myself included. So I think they're doing what they can to, you know, keep information light, uh, which will set them up later to, you know, surpass expectations versus getting those expectations sort of out of control. And on the piece of guidance, which we talked about earlier, I think that's what they did this year with their um, their guidance of 500,000 plus vehicles. Their specific terminology was that they expect to com- comfortably exceed that. Um, so that was pretty clear that they you know, felt very confident in hitting that number. And that's why I do still think something like that might be possible this year, despite all the stuff uh, that's been going on. Right, because we don't know comfortably hit half a million vehicles could be 600,000, it could be 700,000. So yeah. there, there's a little bit of padding there, which I really appreciate as, as someone who has an interest in following Tesla. It seems like they've matured a little bit in terms of how they, how they, the expectations that they do set to investors and media. Uh, this, this, this does give them some cushion there in the event that they do under deliver their internal expectations. Right. <clears throat> yeah, 100% agree. And I think that's sort of the model that um, Apple followed for so many years. And I think um, it's provided a really clear roadmap for, you know, how to manage investor relations. The downside of issuing public guidance that you know is attainable is then it's potentially a little bit less motivating for your workforce if they know that the public goals are below what the internal goals are. So I think that's why Tesla historically has given really aggressive guidance and aggressive timelines on things. Um, and I think that's sort of Elon's mentality in general is to, you know, put something out there and really strive to meet it. And if you don't, um, at least, you know, you put in your best effort versus a more attainable goal. Okay. You achieved it. There's not as much of a motivating factor to go above and beyond that. So I think historically we've seen that from Tesla, but I think lately, you know, as Zach has come on, I think as Martin has had more of an influence, I think them together with Elon have sort of revised their strategy around, um, investor relations a little bit. And I think we're starting to see that come out both in the guidance that was issued this year and with the piece about Model Y and not necessarily mentioning some of the things that we may have expected them to mention in the past. What seems to be taking place though, is that as far as I can tell, looking at the company, they are setting an expectation or a timeline for things. 
and then they're beating it. And so as, as far as I'm concerned, what, whatever shift in their strategy that they've made appears to be working relatively effectively in, in, in terms of uh, under-promising and over-delivering. Uh, a really good example is Model Y. I mean, they were, they were six, months, six months ahead of timeline or so um, of, their, of their, their, their publicly stated expectation, and that's always good. They should, they should do that every single time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely from how the investor community reacts, I think the unknown that we have is, okay, if Tesla had originally said spring 2020 for Model Y, instead of fall 2020, what would the actual timeline have been? Would they have been able to, you know, hit spring 2020 like they are now, or would it have actually been able to happen a little bit more quickly? And that's just something you, you're never going to know, but that's sort of the, the trade-off that you're, you know, you're hypothesizing around when you make more conservative guidance. So I don't think there's any real way of knowing, but I think certainly Tesla has done an amazing job with getting the Model Y rolling. And I think they've done not only in terms of when they actually started shipping it, but I think they're doing the same thing now in terms of getting to volume production. You know, Elon has said a few times that it doesn't matter when we start delivering, it matters when we get to volume production. And he said a couple times that that should be sort of middle of 2020 or some, um, summer of 2020. Um, so I think they're being really conservative there too. And I think like when we're there in a couple months, I think they're probably gonna be well ahead of that 1,000 uh, units per week that Elon said really represents volume production. Have you been following Sandy Monroe's teardowns and what do you make of that in terms of, um, you know, what sort of positive impact that that has on Tesla's financial situation? Yeah, yeah, I definitely have. Um, I'm a few videos behind. I think he's been pumping those out like crazy, which is really awesome to see. Um, it's so nice that we get access to, to that kind of information uh, from someone that has such um, a good grasp of what's going on with a manufacturing perspective. Because certainly, you know, a lot of us that are onlookers don't have that experience. So to have that information available is awesome. Um, definitely helps investors make sense of what's going on. Um, I think in terms of the manufacturability, he's had a lot of positive comments around like the rear casting and things like that. Um, and I think overall he's been just, you know, really complimentary. There have been a couple of pieces like um, the ones that are coming to mind right now is, you know, some paint issues, things like that, a little bit of misalignment. But overall, you know, he said it represents a, a really positive step forward for Model 3. And that's really what you're looking for because Tesla did such an amazing job with Model 3 as represented by, you know, the market share and the sales volume that it's acquired. Um, so for Model Y to be in a better category and be better in initial quality already uh, certainly speaks well to the potential for that vehicle, which, you know, doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. Yeah, there, there's, I watched the video that I think it, he published today where he talked about how it, it didn't appear based on his analysis that, that Tesla had done any significant improvements to their wiring in the vehicle. There was a lot of talk about Tesla significantly reducing the wiring of the Model 3 and utilizing Bluetooth um, to, to communicate with, with the different systems in the car. But uh, from the video, he, he said that it didn't appear like, like they really did much there in terms of reducing the wiring. So I, I, I wonder if that, that's still planned because, um, or, or, if, or if they've shelved it because you know too too, too cost intensive or I, I wonder what they're doing there yeah my perspective on that so we've kind of had a couple of pieces of information that led people to believe that the model y would have that um you know new wiring system where it originated is i think back in like 2017 on one of the earnings calls elon was discussing it and he said basically i'll probably get the numbers wrong here but i think it's um it was like a kilometer or kilometer and a half of wiring overall in the Model 3 and that they would be reducing that to about 100 meters in the Model Y. Uh, so, you know, an order of magnitude reduction in wiring, which obviously helps with manufacturability and speed of production. So we haven't seen that show up now in the Model Y. Um, we had seen some patents filed for it. Um, so I think Electric has posted those at various points in time going back a couple of years now. And... Um, so we're not seeing it now. I think what happened is they probably looked at the timeline for the Model th for the Model Y, and they decided that you know the more similar to the Model Three that they can make it while still making some of the improvements that we've talked about, um, the better. And I think that's probably the right choice, just to you know focus on getting it to market rather than making all of these leaps and bounds um, in terms of the technological progress. But I don't think that's something that Tesla is shelving. I'm sure we'll see it show up at some point. Um, you know, it, it makes sense for them to be working on it. And I, I would be really surprised if it didn't make sense from a cost perspective, um, if it was something that was originally sort of in the roadmap. I think Tesla kind of filters those ideas out pretty quickly. 
So yeah, I would be pretty surprised if we don't see it show up in, you know, the Cybertruck or uh, another vehicle on down the line. Does, do you have Model S and X refresh in your models for 2020? I'm curious to get your take on if, if you're counting on that making a, a significant dent in the, in the half a million vehicles delivered in the year. Uh, not too much. I mean, for me, I, I kind of think about Model S and X as being steady state and any updates that they make to them sort of carry that forward. Um, and just as we continue, you know, they become a smaller and smaller piece of revenue for, for the investors. I think it's really about Model 3 and Model Y and then uh, sort of secondary to that full self-driving and then things like the Cybertruck. Those are so much more important to the financials of the business than S and X, even if volume does increase there. It would be awesome if we could get back to 100,000 per year like we were sort of before Model 3. Um, but even regardless, you know, even with pretty significant updates, I don't necessarily see that happening. I think the updates do serve to just prove technological prowess that Tesla has and the competitive advantage. And I think that helps with the brand and I think that helps with investor sentiment. So there are a lot of benefits to doing it other than just strictly maybe the improved volume that they could get off an improved product. Um, Cause I don't, I don't necessarily anticipate too much of that happening, but we'll see. I mean, the plaid refresh is, is definitely going to be, you know, that'd be the most significant easily since the Raven update. And then probably even more, more than that, maybe back to even when we had the, the sort of front fascia refresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up uh, with uh, our conversation here, Rob. It's uh, super good to catch up and thank you for your insight. I really appreciate all the uh, technical financial uh, insight that you provide on a, on a daily basis. And uh, if, if people aren't, aren't watching your, your, your YouTube channel, listening to your audio podcast, they should definitely do that. Where can people find that? Yeah, so you can pretty much find it on any podcast app. Uh, just search for Tesla Daily. It should come up. Um, otherwise, on YouTube, again, search for Tesla Daily. And then I'm also on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. Awesome, man. All right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, joining the, the channel and jumping on a video. And I'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Sean.